Hello! We're going to be talking about the rise of the Roman Empire in this PowerPoint. This is a part of Rome called the Forum, and when you go to Rome, um, you can actually walk through sections of this. Um, it's one of the most interesting parts of visiting Italy, and, and specifically in Rome, because these buildings are close to 2,000 years old. So. Um, it's a fascinating representation of what Roman life used to be. All right, so let's talk about the first Roman emperor. His name was Octavian. If you remember back to the, the uh, Roman Republic and Julius Caesar, just to review, Julius Caesar becomes emperor or dictator for life. The Senate is not happy about that. <clears throat> They assassinate him on the Ides of March, and then the Empire, or the Republic, is left in the hands of two men, Octavian and Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony goes to um, the East, specifically Egypt, and takes up with Cleopatra. Octavian manages to run a very successful smear campaign, telling people that uh, Mark Anthony is looking only to give Rome away to the Egyptians, and specifically Cleopatra. So when all is said and done, Octavian and Mark Anthony have a huge battle. Octavian wins, and Octavian becomes the first emperor of the Roman Empire. Um, he set up a political system that was stable for approximately 200 years. So um, despite the inauspicious beginnings, he actually sets up a pretty stable environment. Um, and when, as you see his, um, the folks who take after him or who become emperors after him, the fact that he was able to maintain the empire through some of their inadequacies and downright illegal behavior is pretty amazing. Um, because of the empire's vast extent, meaning it's very big, and long endurance, Roman influence upon language, religion, architecture, philosophy, law, and government of nations around the world lasts to this day. One of the things that I'm going to be pointing out as we go through this PowerPoint is the fact that so many elements that existed in the Roman Empire exist today in the United States 2,000 years later. Um, and essentially, the Romans believed that it was their divine mission to rule nations and peoples. And the United States has oftentimes been accused of wanting to run the world, essentially. So let's talk about the age of Augustus. Um, he becomes emperor in 31 BC, and he um, reigns till 14 AD. And so that's an extremely long time to... Um, run an empire. He, as I had mentioned, he's the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. He was groomed to take over Rome. And um, when Caesar was assassinated, the whole situation with Mark Anthony occurred. And ultimately, um, Octavian became emperor. And he restored the idea, this is the important word, the idea of the Republic in 27 BCE to satisfy the Senate. Now, the reality was is that he was the emperor and everybody knew it. Um, but the illusion, the perception that the Republic was still intact was the important thing, at least in terms of the Senate maintaining their power base. Um, this is indicative of the kind of person that Octavian was. He really knew how to, quote unquote, work people. So the Senate bestowed on him the title of Augustus, otherwise known as Revered One. And this is where the month of August comes from, from this Augustus. Um, he preferred the title Princeps, which is chief citizen or first among equals, meaning that he's no better than anyone else. And of course, you know, he was the emperor. So it was that false modesty that really appealed to people. His rule is sometimes called the Principate, where he was co-ruler with the Senate of the Empire. The reality was that Octavian was in charge. However, because he appeared to share power with the Senate, 
He was very popular. And the Senate appreciated the fact that he allowed them to maintain their power and their dignity and their level of respect. And so that really set the tone for his um, reign as emperor. Augustus maintained an army of 150,000, and that works out to 28 legions, or 5,400 men to a legion. Uh, most of these soldiers came from Italy and were citizens of Rome. Um, he also maintained an auxiliary force of 130,000 men, enlisted from other areas that had been taken over by Rome. So his main army were Romans. His auxiliary army were people who became Roman but were not Roman by, for, by birth. He also established the Praetorian Guard, who are going to become very important in a few emperors. Um, and these were the 9,000 men who guarded the emperor. And um, this Praetorian Guard becomes very powerful in terms of working with and assisting the emperors uh, maintain their power base. Augustus also, in terms of the bureaucratic organization of the empire, was very good. He developed a new system for managing the frontiers and the provinces. He and the Senate split the provinces and each appointed governors. Augustus called his governors legates, or deputies, and eventually he took over appointing all legates. But again, you know, this is an eventual thing. The value of this behavior is that he gave people the appearance that he shared power. He stabilized the provinces, expanded Roman rule northward until they hit the Rhine. Um, the Germanic tribes held them back, and Augustus did not attempt to push back. He realized at some point that a battle is not worth winning or losing if it's going to cost so many men and so much money. Um, so again, he showed some very intelligent leadership because he didn't just do things for the sake of doing them. He did them with purpose. Uh, Augustan society. And this is something that is very important in terms of understanding who was really in charge in Rome. The social stratification inherited from the Republic. So there were three levels of society. You had the senators. They helped run the empire. They held high government office and senior military posts, and they governed the provinces. To be eligible to be a senator, a citizen had to have property worth one million sesteres. And just to kind of put it in context for you, military men made 900 sesteres a year. So we're not talking about your average person becoming a senator. These people were very, very rich. And their wealth allowed them the influence in terms of running society. If you think about modern day United States, the vast majority of our senators and Congress people are wealthy, some wealthy beyond imagination. And the way that most of these politicians work today is they require political donations in order to get elected because nobody wants to spend their own money other than Mitt Romney, who blew almost half a billion dollars trying to be um, president. But what they do is money in this world, in the United States, is really who determines who's in charge. Nobody who is poor and does not have political donations could possibly get into the Congress or the Senate today. And very similar to what we see with the Romans. The next level was the equestrian. And these were all Roman citizens who held property worth 400 sesteres. Um, they held lesser positions than the senatorial class, but they could still hold government and military office. Then you have everybody else, the lower classes, and this was the overwhelming majority of free citizens. So when we look at the vast number of people in Rome at this time, and it's about a million people living in the city of Rome, the very small percentage, one to five to ten percent actually ran the, the the empire these were the wealthy people and again if you look at the United States and you see who's actually running the United States it tends to be very wealthy people and the vast majority of us um, think 
we have a democratic voice, but with the advent of more and more political donations, we have less of a voice. We have less choice. Most of us bemoan the fact that we are given a choice of two or three candidates who none of us really like, but they're the ones who were able to raise the money. Augustus was a social conservative. Um, he believed in what we call family values. He encouraged larger families. He discouraged love affairs outside of marriage. He exiled his own daughter, Julia, who is in the picture over here, um, for adultery. Um, Julia was, by all accounts, a pretty loose woman who liked to party and have sex with many, many different partners and um, rubbed her, fa her father's face in it. So, you know, many people, many of the historians believe that um, Augustus was making a point. Um, there's also other historians who don't believe that Julia was all that bad. She was in an arranged marriage, so she had an affair on the side and with someone that she cared about. But, you know, 2,000 years ago, we don't have anyone still around to tell us what actually happened. But there's a lot of debate on how naughty Julia actually was. Augustus uh, made divorce more difficult to get, and he revised the tax laws to punish bachelors, widowers, and families with less than three children. And again, today in this country, you get much better tax benefits if you're married, if you have children, um, and those kinds of things are very important in terms of letting society know what is expected of them. Octavian Augustus ruled Rome for almost 45 years, achieving peace and prosperity. This is called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. That would be a very good thing to know for the midterm. Um, it laid the foundation for the next 150 years of Roman history. So this context of the Roman peace is what allowed society to grow in Rome. Um, if you are constantly at war, you are spending all your money fighting wars. Whereas if you are at peace, you can build up the infrastructure of the city, meaning building buildings, increasing roads, building various and sundry water and utility projects. Augustus designated his stepson Tiberius as his successor. Tiberius was Augustus's wife Livia's son from her first marriage. So Augustus had been married before Livia and had a daughter Julia. He had no other children that survived to adulthood. Ty um, Augustus's second wife Livia also had a son from her first marriage. So, and his name was Tiberius. Tiberius was forced to divorce his first wife, whom he loved very much, and marry Julia. So, Tiberius and Julia are both stepchildren to their respective stepparents, and now they're married. Throughout Augustus's rule and the subsequent rule of Tiberius, more and more power was given to the princeps. And when we think about this idea of a son or a son-in-law taking over from his father-in-law, you know, it's again because women were not seen as equals to men and women were never given the opportunity to rule. The more power that is placed on the emperor, the more likely corruption and arbitrary acts will take place. Now, Augustus, he had worked really hard to become emperor and he did a really good job even though people didn't always agree with what he chose to do. Tiberius, on the other hand, was forced to divorce the wife he loved, marry a woman who was cheating on him with all kinds of people, and eventually become emperor. The other thing is that Tiberius's mother, Livia, who was married to Octavian, had a little side hobby, which was poisoning enemies. So he knew that if he didn't follow the rules, he would end up on the pile of dead bodies that his mother left in her her wake. So Tiberius, he was a military man. He had spent his whole life more or less with other men being manly in the military. And it started off pretty well. But he became a little paranoid because when you're emperor, everybody wants to take you down. And he started putting his on enemies on trial for treason. 
Then his son died in battle, and he became even more withdrawn and depressed. And he essentially left Rome and moved to an island called Capri, right off of Italy, where he practiced what we would consider today to be pedophilia. He had young boys and girls who basically were there to service him. And um, the irony, of course, is that his wife, Julia, was um, exiled for adultery, and what he was doing was much, much worse. But uh, because he was isolated, away from Rome, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted without any consequences. Tiberius died in 37. In his will, Tiberius left his powers jointly to Caligula, who was Augustus's grandnephew, and Tiberius Gemellus, who was Tiberius's grandson. And you'll see Caligula over here and Tiberius Gemellus over here. Caligula's first act on becoming princeps was to void Tiberius's will and have Gemellus executed. So, right from the beginning, we know that Cal Caligula is no joke, and he will kill anyone who gets in his way. The problem with somebody like that is that they're a little crazy. So, the first couple years, he was pretty good. He was, you know, kept things on the up and up, and then it went downhill. So, the first two years were okay. The second two years of his rule, he went off the hook. He was cruel. He was extravagant. He was um, sexually perverse. He was essentially an insane dictator. Um, and this is where the Praetorian Guard comes in. The Praetorian Guard, who are there to, in fact, protect the emperor, realized that Caligula was essentially ruining the Roman Empire. And before he could do too much more damage, they assassinated him. Um, some of the crimes that Cal Caligula has been known for was um, he named his horse a senator to basically tell the Senate that they were nothing more than a bunch of animals that he decided to feed or not feed. And he was also having a sexual affair with his sister, which even then was considered a little bit um, inappropriate, actually a lot inappropriate. After Caligula is killed, the Praetorian Guard really don't have anyone left in the family to put on the throne other than Claudius, who is Caligula's uncle. And Claudius is not the kind of man who comes across as an emperor. He had some sort of disability, and no one had ever considered him appropriate to run the empire. He walked with a limp, his knees were weak, um, his head shook like he had Parkinson's disease, he stammered, his speech was confused, he drooled, his nose ran all the time. Um, so this kind of physical appearance really put people off. But in retrospect, modern historians think that he may have had cerebral palsy and or Tourette syndrome. So uh, it didn't affect his mind as much as his physical body. Claudius was named emperor, and he spent most of his rule essentially justifying himself as a good emperor, which meant he was a really, really good emperor. Um, of course, you know, he got married to his wife Agrippina, who had had a son by her first marriage. His name was Nero. And Agrippina, after a few years, decided she was tired of Claudius, and she poisoned him so that her son, Nero, could ascend the throne. This is Nero, and this is Claudius. Nero openly had his enemies killed. He made no bones about it. And he had his mother killed because she held power over him because she's the one who killed Claudius so he could take the throne. Nero made almost all the other emperors look like child's play, other than Caligula. Nero was convinced that he was a great actor, singer, dancer, all of those things. And pretty much his whole rule was focused on being a narcissist. He wanted to build a new palace, so instead of going and finding empty space, he burned down parts of Rome so that he could build his palace. Um, again, the Praetorian Guard comes in, and they say to him, listen, 
you are either going to be assassinated by us or you can commit suicide. Now for most of history, up until really the 20th century, suicide was a more honorable way than being killed. So you'll see in historical terms, a lot of these great rulers or perceived great rulers chose to um, commit suicide rather than face the executioner because it was seen as taking responsibility and being honorable. So the forced suicide of the Emperor Nero in AD 68 was followed by a brief period of civil war. And you saw three different emperors rise and fall just as quickly. Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. And once Vitellius was taken out, then Vespasian came in. And this is Vespasian and his purple. Purple is the color of royalty. Um, and he was the first ruler of the Flavian dynasty. He was a good, solid ruler. He is best known for constructing the Colosseum, as well as implementing a lot of the financial reforms that essentially saved Rome from the excesses of Nero. Um, Vespasian was succeeded first by his son Titus, who only ruled for two years, and then Domitian, who ruled for another 15. So these three men form the Flavian dynasty. From 96 to 180, we have the era of five good emperors. This was Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius, Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. These emperors did a good job. And what does that mean? They treated the ruling classes with respect. Because here's the bottom line, folks. It doesn't matter how much power you have. If the people who have the money have decided to take you down, they will take you down. And Julius Caesar, Caligula, and Nero can all tell you that. They cooperated with the Senate. They ended arbitrary executions. In other words, if you were executed, you did something really bad. Um, they maintained the peace throughout the empire. And again, people like peace. They don't want to have to send their sons off to war. They supported the domestic policies of the empire. They were tolerant, diplomatic, and most importantly, they developed extensive building projects, i.e. that infrastructure I was mentioning. Keep in mind that to build infrastructure, you need to hire people. So that was the other thing is they put people to work. People like to feel productive. They were contributing to the Roman Empire and getting paid for it. So these five guys did a lot to move Rome towards its height. Trajan extended the empire through Europe, Mesopotamia, and the Middle East. Hadrian realized that extending the empire was dangerous because it required too much governance. So he did not extend the empire. Um, he had moved into Britannia, which is England today, and moved up into Scotland. And at the time, um, the Scots were also known as the Picts, and this was a Celtic tribe that was essentially barbarians. And Hadrian realized that he didn't want to expend the, the manpower, the money, and the weaponry it would take to take Scotland. So he built a wall. It's called Hadrian's Wall. And if you go to Scotland today, you can walk along sections of the wall that is still standing keeping in mind that we're talking about something that's almost 2,000 years old. Sorry about that. This is Scotland, and this is Britannia, England, Hibernia in those days, which became modern-day Ireland. And then all of this area now is Roman. Rome allowed locals to keep their languages and customs, but Latin was the official language. Um, if you were to do business, if you were to conduct government affairs, you had to know Latin. And of course, who knew Latin? Roman citizens and the wealthy. With peace comes unprecedented trade opportunities. Increased trade stimulated manufacturing, which stimulated more trade. So Rome was becoming very, very wealthy. Um, the people of Rome were all benefiting. Everybody was happy. And this was a really good time to be a Roman. 
Next, we want to talk about some of the issues of Roman law that we'll see in the United States today. Um, classical principles were developed. All men are created equal. And again, we recognize this, but it wasn't followed in Rome in the same way that in 1776, when the Constitution um, of the United States was being drafted and they said all men are created equal, eh, not so much. Not if you were African, if you were a woman, if you were Hispanic, um, if you were a white man who owned land, you were considered equal. A person is considered innocent until proven guilty. Again, another fundamental concept in our Constitution. An accused person could defend themselves before a judge, and judges were supposed to be impartial and look only at the evidence. Again, all of these elements are in our United States Constitution and Bill of Rights. And who was that written by? Primarily Thomas Jefferson, who was, in fact, a scholar of Greek and Roman history. Interesting how that works out. Just talk about women. Upper class women had more um, freedom than ever before. They could own, inherit, and dispose of property. They could go out in public without a male escort. And they could own their own business. This is, again, something that was very unique and very rare. Um, and even today in Saudi Arabia, Somalia, some of the other more fundamentalist countries, women can't do any of this stuff in 2014. Roman emperors, starting with Augustus, promised the citizenry grain and entertainment, and this became known as bread and circuses. Um, a circus is not what we think of today with clowns and elephants, but rather a circus is a circuit. It's a racetrack. And so they had chariot races, they had gladiatorial shows. These were essentially free activities that the citizens could go to, and they had free bread. So what the purpose behind this was, it kept people occupied. And if people are occupied with food and entertainment, they don't think about any of the political issues. They don't think about revolting. They don't think about getting rid of this emperor and putting somebody else in. And if you think about today, how you can go to McDonald's and order off the dollar menu, or you can go and watch Netflix for a month for $8 a month, that's pretty much what we see in the United States today. It's all about keeping people occupied so we're not paying that much attention to what the government is doing, for better or for worse. Religion. Um, it was a polytheistic religion, meaning they had many gods and goddesses, most of whom they adapted directly from the Greeks. Um, for example, the Greek god Zeus became the Roman god Jupiter. And you'll see all of the Greek gods and goddesses and then their Roman equivalents. And this is what they were gods of. Now, these are all the things that are very important to people. And we have briefly discussed in the past how... Most of the religions was seen at this time as a, we'll keep the gods happy and they'll be nice to us. Sort of a quid pro quo. I do this, you do that. Um, and then the other issue is, of course, Romans love ceremonies and rituals. So this was a big part of their day-to-day -day life. And again, it was another way to distract people and not have them think about what was actually going on in the kingdom or the empire. One of the big issues that um, a lot of people are under the misunderstanding is that when Jesus was crucified, it was not because um, the Jews turned him in or you know, um, there are people who truly believe that the Jews caused Jesus' death. And that's just not right. In fact, there are many records that demonstrate the Christians were persecuted by the Romans, not because of Jesus, but because they believed in a monotheistic religion. Rome allowed other cultures to worship their own gods. They didn't care who you worshipped. But the Christians come in and they say there's only one God. One God, one God only. And that basically negates everybody else's God. So this threatened the public order. This threatened the way people lived in Rome. They wanted people to be Roman first and then whatever religion second. 
the persecution of Christians was not even systematic, but sporadic, because the Christians represented such a small minority. And as you saw in the Roman Republic, crucifixion was a standard punishment. Um, Nero, in 64, was the one who really escalated the um, persecution of the Christians. He started um, throwing them into the battle gladiatorial battles against lions. So um, when we're looking at the historical element, it was really because they were monotheistic rather than polytheistic and that disrupted order. They didn't care about Jesus that much. He was just another person who disobeyed the Roman way. So we're getting to the end of the second century, the beginning of the third, and some stuff begins to happen that's not so good for Rome. Um, the river Tiber flooded, there was a famine, the plague was brought back from the east, there was a shortage of manpower, meaning the military was shorthanded. Then we get the emperor in 193, Septimus Severus. I know his name is very familiar to our ha Harry Potter fans. And he was a firm believer in a military society, kind of a Spartan, uh, latter-day Spartan. His sons, who took over at his death, also perpetuated this idea. They expanded the army, the soldiers' pay was increased, and military officers became government officials. And the problem was that when you have too much power in the military, the generals are becoming the competitors for the emperorship. And as a consequence, this begins the end of the Roman Empire. We see chaos resulting. But we're not near the end yet. We still have some good emperors coming. So, you know, we still have a couple last gasps going on for the Roman Empire. 